right, you ready to do this, co-host? Oh, I'm ready, co-host. Let's light right. it up this Monday morning. All right, then. Welcome to the Educause Rising Voices podcast, where we amplify the voices of young professionals in higher education. I'm Wes Johnson, and I'm joined by the amazing... Sarah Buska. All right. And today, first, Sarah, how are you doing? I am doing so well today, Wes. And the topic of today's conversation, I feel, is so apropos because we're coming off of a holiday weekend, uh, Thanksgiving. Right. So I'm feeling great. I've been away from work for four days. <laughs> so <laughs> life is good. <laughs> and it's great to see you this Monday morning. Yeah. How about you? How are you doing? So the feeling's mutual. Great to see you. Uh, still got a case of the Mondays, no matter how long I've been away. I still It still feels like a Monday, but uh, feeling good also after the break. Looking forward to the next break where I got it set up to be a little bit longer uh, than Thanksgiving because <laughs> uh, I'm very much in need of the the recharge this year. It's been a, been a busy year. It's been a very well, busy no. year. I feel like my brain is still somewhere in July. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't mm-hmm. know what happened. I don't know how it's December this month or this week it's just it's crazy i don't i don't yep. know i feel like ever since pandemic times each year since 2020 i feel like has just been fed up just even more so than we've you know had historically and i always find myself at this time of year feeling like how did all of that happen in such a short mm-hmm. amount of time even though it's the same calendar time <laughs> ain't that the truth yeah i, I uh start my weeks by looking at my list my my to-do list which is a bit of like my wish list more than my actual to do list on whether I get it done or not. But uh, uh, I was looking at it and just how many things I had marked as December. I'm like, okay, but I got to December. And it's like, oh, yeah, okay, December next yeah, week. All right. <laughs> yeah. there you go. I feel that. I feel that. All this work on our plate and talks of break, I guess it makes this a very timely uh, uh, topic for us, which is why rechart is important and how to reconnect and reintegrate after the holidays. I can definitely preach on why rechart is important. So maybe we'll start there. Uh, I'm actually very interested in the reintegrating part because I, I feel like that's just a bunch of uh, walking in the dark until I get back into my pace. So I'm very interested in that part. <laughs> but let's start with why recharge is in, important. Uh, I, I'll tell you now, for me personally, um, kind of what you were speaking on since COVID, but it feels like IT has been speeding up for forever and and whatever they were doing with 30 years ago, uh, we're at a much faster pace now because we've automated the thing that they were dealing with, right? <laughs> and uh, to, to be able to, like, we're, we're always problem solving because that's what we're fixed to do, at least in the, in the IT, the technology space. We're fixed to problem solve, so we're always jumping from one thing to the next to the next. And uh, I just can't keep up. If I don't completely separate from the process, uh, I think the recharge one, of course, the it helps me re- have time for my family, have time for myself, but also gives me a moment to remember why the heck I'm even coming into this eight to five to, be- to begin with. Um, when you get caught up in the work, I, at least for me, I lose sight of that. I'm just going from problem to problem, forgetting sometimes forget the bigger picture of why I even come in today, why we're here, why these jobs exist. So it's nice to just step away and be able to look at it for a sec, not touch it, just look at it for a sec. <laughs> just look in the distance. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> just kind of look out and say, you know, you know what I mean? So well, what about you? Those are, I mean, I love what you're saying, Wes, and it's so true. I think what I was hearing a lot from, from your comments are on perspective, right? And just being able to recognize that ourselves and in, in work and in, in our work bubble are not the only places where we exist. And we we need to take a step back and see ourselves outside of that space, but also see ourselves in other spaces as well and make sure we're setting time for that. And I think a lot about, you know, when I was an undergrad, this was well, well over a decade ago, but I remember some advice I got my freshman year from my Russian professor, who was more like a mentor and a friend to me who I still talk to this day. But I remember I was studying for my first Russian exam it was so hard. I had never taken Russian before. I had no no idea what I was getting myself yeah. into. I just thought it was cool and wanted to sign up for it. So that here I am. Cool. It was awesome, <laughs> but it was hard. It was very hard. And I remember my first exam, I was studying and I was thinking, okay, I'm going to pull an all-nighter. I'm just going to stay up and just pack all of this into my brain and 
keep going until I just can memorize basically every page, every verb conjugation, every vocab word, you know, all of that. And I was telling my professor the strategy and he was just looking at me and smiling and nodding. And I have to give him credit to this day. He let me go on and on about how I was going to memorize everything when he could have just cut me off. But he just looked at me and he's like, you will literally not be functioning tomorrow to take this exam <laughs> if you're going to stay up all night. And he's like, I can tell you, you will not pass. And he's like, just go to sleep. Just, just go to sleep. Just get a good night's rest. Just relax. You have to learn how to do this if you want to be successful in college and in your life. Mm -hmm. And I think I never pulled an all-nighter, never in my college career, even though I was a grad student, well over a decade later. We'll never do it. I always prioritize sleep. And, you know, I, that kind of just woke me up. But I think it's something that we all implicitly know and are aware of. But sometimes we just don't make the time for it and we don't really prioritize it. And, you know, it sounds so simple, you know, to get some sleep. But it's something that I think is a skill to learn. Just just like recharging is a skill to learn. Just like happiness is a skill to learn. Um yeah. And I think about that often, <laughs> even when I'm convinced yeah. I'm in grad school to stay up and finish my work. Mm -hmm. I hear is that Russian professor yeah. <laughs> telling me to just go home and go to bed. <laughs> yeah. What a great professor. And I'd say there's also a lesson in that in like the, that sounds like the pre professor was kind of setting up an environment to say, Hey, look, that whole all nighter thing is not going to work. I mean, Hey, you're an adult now, go do what you want, <laughs> yeah. but I'm telling you, I don't think that's going to work. Go, go get some rest come back if you've been doing what you've been supposed to have been doing this whole class i think you'll be good to go yeah. it's, it's kind of what right. i'm teasing out in there and that's it's very similar in our roles right like i i hope that i set an example with my staff and my teams to take advantage of, of time taking off and i know that some of that can be as much cultural as it is like individualized but to your point it was it's also learned like i you have to get some of us have to get comfortable with even saying like hey i'm gonna be you know, for lack of a better term, selfish this week. I'm not going <laughs> to, I'm not checking. I'm not going to be very easy to contact. No, I'm not going to be yeah. problem solving this week. Uh, at least not here. I got some right. other things that I want to prioritize for the next week. And it's, and it's not here this week, y'all. Yeah. I'm taking my time. And uh, that can be a, that, that could be quite the space to be in sometimes, especially when you have a large amount of people depending on you, whether it's direct report lines or a project you're leading in or yeah. just a process that you know you're the most knowledgeable about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's so true. And what, what I'm hearing you say, and, and another thing I think is a really essential skill for all of us to learn, especially during the time of holidays when we want to disconnect and then later reconnect is how we state boundaries and how we hold them. And I think those are two very different things and require different skill sets, right? It's one thing to say, say to our teams, say to our staff, say to our leaders, I'm not available during this time. I have been taking vacation, right? Or I'm celebrating my anniversary, what have you, for whatever reason. If you're saying I'm not available, that's one thing. But if you're contacted when you're not available and respond, yes. well, you're not holding your boundary and you're just teaching that person that you are available. You know, and that that is something I think is a true skill, too, because I think a lot of us, myself included, sometimes struggle with that guilt. Right. Like you said, if you're the only person who knows something mm -hmm. and something happens when you're out, you feel this kind of intense guilt or some of us, you know, might feel this intense drive to jump in and just problem solve and fix. You know, being yeah. folks in I.T., we love to do that. Right. It's almost mm -hmm. like this, like adrenaline pinching experience to just solve a problem and fix something. Yep. But if we've said that, hey, I'm out of office, or even I'm just taking a personal day, sick a day, what have you, then take it. You're not at that point being held accountable. And the only person who's who's holding you accountable to that is you to show up when you've said yep. you're not going going to be available. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there was a lesson I learned uh, from a previous leader. His name's Mike Lucas. When we were at the University of Georgia, and I was working the help desk at the time. And uh, I was one of those folks. We just got the help that's kind of running s smoothly at the time. And we didn't, you know, we didn't want that to stop. And so I, I had none of us, me or my team, had taken much time off over a good one, two year period, just trying to get everything, oh. you know, going. And uh, Mike Lucas, who was our CTO at the time, he came to me and he actually advised, like, hey, man, holiday's coming up. 
you know, I think uh, just want to encourage you and your staff take advantage of the time or whatever. And I didn't think nothing. I was just like, yeah, 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 whatever. You know, I got some stuff I need to get done. So I might just take advantage of the quiet time, like we all like to say. And uh, he, he stopped and he looked at me and said, look, Wes, I get it because, you know, things are going good and you and your team should be proud of that. Uh, this university has been here a very long time, Wes, uh, both before you, it'll be here after you. And there's been a lot of stuff that's broken along the way, yet the university's still here. Just remember that <laughs> <laughs> as you think about it, you should be in for that extra few days to get that little bit more work done. Uh, yeah. You know, the university will be here regardless. I think you're good. Uh, so I took some time off during that time. And that, that's how I like to frame it sometimes, even with my own <laughs> staff. And just like, look, yeah, I get it. You might be the only person that knows, but you've been the only person for a, a little while. The university's been here for a long while. <laughs> Right, think, right. I and I we'll guarantee we'll, it's yeah, it will still be here when you get <laughs> yeah. back. I promise. And if it's gone, it's not because of what you knew. I promise you it's not <laughs> <laughs> it's not it's not because of that. <laughs> That's such a good point. Yeah, the problem will still be here when you come back. <laughs> you know, I actually I want to touch on something because you mentioned the help desk and I started my uh technology career working in a help desk. So okay. I have a very special kind of spot in my heart and respect for folks who work on a help desk, um, just because I think we all all know who've been in it, at least, mm -hmm. how much, you know, of a grueling role it can be just being, you know, front lines, working with folks directly who are calling because something's wrong, right? They're upset. Mm -hmm. And typically those folks are dealing with, you know, hundreds of calls a day of just really upset people. Mm -hmm. Sometimes saying mean things, right? Uh -huh. And, you know, and, and that's an essential service, right? It's something that even if there's a holiday, even if there is a, a break, those services don't stop just because there's a holiday or, or a break. It's it's a freight train moving, you know, at hundreds of miles an hour, and it needs to run to support the university. Mm -hmm. And so I just want to kind of call that, call this out because I, I want to tease this apart a little bit on the show because those folks in those positions, sometimes they can't take off, right? Sometimes yeah. they don't have the luxury of taking two weeks off, three weeks off. Uh, sometimes they need to work to support their families, right? Sometimes they just are willing to make that sacrifice to make sure that they have more money coming in if they're not in a salaried position. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we're thinking about recharge and how you kind of disconnect, if you really can't maybe physically leave work or physically take that time off, um, how do you do that, right? How do you find that respite or that recharge when you still have to come and show up? Do you have any yeah. recommendations? <laughs> yeah, that's always one of the challenges in the, uh, at least in the frontline areas, likely and some others, but I know frontline feels that a lot. Uh, one is, you know, the typical times a year to take off on the only times is the thing I used to remind my staff. Like, sure, we might have to cover during the Thanksgiving or the New Year's and we rotate on who can we keep track of who's here this year, but some people, like you said, they'd rather work and, and get the time. Uh, but, you know, middle of June when, you know, most of your campus is gone and there's no holiday is also a great time to recharge. I mean, sometimes, you know, it, it, it gets it gets to some of your own individual values, in my opinion, too. Like for some people, you know, you, you pick a certain field, a certain job. And, and, and in my personal opinion, there are certain sacrifices that come with anything you choose to do. And say if you choose to go into IT and your path starts or is at the help desk, then I, I think it's best to have an understanding of, okay, here's the sacrifices that come with that. I'm This, if this help desk is 24-7 through holidays, then that means that the typical times I expect to be off, I may not be able to get off. But what can I do to adjust if, if I still value this time for myself and, and then work around the work around that but then also keep in mind that if it crosses a the line then maybe there's another field or another place not not every help desk is 24 7. i worked this song where we did get the holidays off so you know there's there's a lot that goes into that and i don't want to hog the whole episode we got some of it's individualized some of it is just you know take advantage of other terms that are slow and i'd say the leaders like particularly those who are in management or those that run you know you understand the business i i hope you know, you advocate and push for your staff to take advantage of the times that you know uh, they can take advantage of, even if it means they can't take a month off, like maybe some of their faculty partners or some of their other uh, individuals who can who have that advantage in their role they are. Take it when you can. Yeah. What about you? What are, what are your thoughts on that? I, I First, I, I just want to say, I think those are great comments. And I really love 
how you're framing it from, you know, an individual lens. And there's things that are under your control and your agency and that you are responsible for. And then there's, of course, you know, the situation and, and the role in, in the company, the organization, what have you. Um, you know, there's responsibility there as well. It's shared. Mm -hmm. It's not mm -hmm. on one entirely or the other entirely. It's shared. And I think it's all of our responsibilities as workers, as leaders, as managers to know how to advocate for ourselves, for our roles, for our universities, for our teams, and how to negotiate and compromise, right? I mean, I think mm -hmm. there's so many of us, and maybe we learned this, or at least I learned this a lot during the pandemic is things ebb and flow. You know, it, it, even if you started the year off by saying we will do X, Y, and Z, well, a global pandemic comes up and well, you kind of have to throw that out of the window. So how yeah. are you going to adapt and reframe and recognize that, hey, maybe we need to take a step back a little bit and give everyone some time off. But we also are expecting, you know, folks, if they're working in, in you know, front lines, like you said, help desk. Maybe that there's something that they need to be we be working on too, and taking you know some agency and accountability for. Like you said, if if they had a realization that that's not their role, that's okay, right? I think so many of us maybe have felt that or are feeling that now, and I think it's okay to to say, hey, this isn't for me, or this isn't working out, or I don't feel like I'm getting you know recharged in the way that that I should, because I think if we really are in a role that we like. We may not like all of the tax, tasks that we do, but we should be getting recharged or at least fueled and getting some wins in our sales from the work that we're doing. If, if we're really enjoying it, if it's aligning with our skills and our personality and our career goals and all those types of things. So I think it's multifaceted, yeah. right? But I do think that individual component is huge. And I want to switch gears a little bit and bring up something that uh, Joseph Cottle from Notre Dame, he's our YPCG co-lead, um, recommended for some ways to recharge as well. And it sounds maybe simple and obvious, but he recommended finding some hobbies, doing exercise, just doing something to focus your attention on something else that you love or that you enjoy or that you care about. It could be playing with your dog, being with your family, going outside, going for a walk, right? Mm -hmm. Those mm -hmm. little things. I used to do that when I worked in the help desk all the time. I would take 15 oh, yeah. minute breaks when I could yep. and just go for a walk outside. And it was so helpful just kind of processing everything, getting exposed to nature, you know, getting that perspective. And I think that that's a really, I think, helpful tool to remember that we all have to be intentional in practicing that. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't mean you have to go and like, you know, spend a lot of money and join some fancy gym and, you know, all yeah. that kind of stuff. Um, it, it is within, you know, grasp if, if you're willing to to make the time for it and, and to at least bring folks along who you care and love about to help hold you accountable to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Definitely uh, doubling down on the walks. Uh, we used to, I used to do that also. I still do it today, but not as much with this new kind of COVID work environment, pre, or I guess <laughs> post COVID work environment. We but, do uh, our walks at home. Uh -huh, yeah. and mm -hmm. uh -huh, ain't that the truth? Yeah. So uh, I walk, start the coffee, forget about the coffee at the thing. <laughs> this is usually my walk. Uh, but uh, yeah, we used to, I used to walk a whole lot on campus, particularly around this time of year. It's a beautiful time if you're out east. In some other areas too, but I know back uh, back home in east and south, it's a very beautiful time of the year to go walk your campuses. Uh, also, yeah. gave me perspective, remind me of this big place that we support and and uh, help solve problem solve for. Uh, so I definitely just want to double up on the walks. I used to tell my staff all the time, "Hey, every ten minutes on the hour, get away from the desk. I don't care if you just walk to the back of the building or take a walk outside. Stop looking at that screen." For 10 yeah. minutes every hour, please. <laughs> That's all right. Let's please save our eyeballs. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. So going up next, I think we had a couple more pieces of feedback. So have something to put on your mind when you're away other than work. I think you kind of spoke on that, but are there hobbies that you do outside of work? I have a couple I could share, but what about you, Sarah? Are there things that you do when you do get that downtime from work? Yes, I do. I can't wait to hear your hobbies. I think I know some already. Uh, actually, I think two of our hobbies might align, so I'm curious to see okay. how this plays out. But um, one hobby I love, and I've been doing this since I was in second grade. It's been a long time. Um, I play violin, and um, I've been just playing for so long in orchestra by myself, 
with friends, just kind of the whole smorgasbord, if you will. And right before the pandemic, I was playing, um, when I was working at the University of Wisconsin, playing in the University of Wisconsin Chamber Orchestra. And I was loving it. I was fully committed. I was spending way too many hours a week <laughs> with it, which was, you know, good and bad for different reasons. Um, but when the pandemic hit, that's when, you know, everything shut down. So I couldn't mm -hmm. play with the orchestra anymore. And it was something where I was thinking, okay, well, what's keeping me playing this? Is it the orchestra? Or is it because I really, really like it. Because at this point, you know, I'm busy with a career, all these mm -hmm. other things. Mm -hmm. And I still kept playing. And I did like many little orchestra concerts and playing sessions, like on Instagram and all that kind of stuff for months, just playing by myself. And I still, I still am playing, even though I'm in grad school now, it's, doesn't, I don't have as much time. But I still play, just not for the orchestra. And that's one right. thing I think that's always been very important to me and just an escape and just a way that I can kind of focus my mind in a different way is through music. Yeah. And I know that's for you too. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Music, Want to do a so, mashup? Yeah, we should, yeah. I can rap we should. Like a violin solo or something. We, we could add to you the intro, sir. <laughs> although i think our intro for this show is really awesome thanks to you for folks in the audience who may not know wes created our intro music so that's why it sounds so cool <laughs> thank you for that yeah speaking of i do do music uh that's a that is a big one uh i rap and produce um and so i was actually writing some songs a little bit this weekend just for the fun of it uh I think the the trap that I've sometimes fallen in is because music was my first love and, you know, go back 10, 15 years, I was going to be a rap star. None of this IT stuff. Who was going to work a nine to five? I was going to go be a rap star. That's what I was going to do, or at least a, a big time producer. You know, life didn't necessarily work out that way, uh, but uh, it did. It kind of put me at this uh, line of, you know, is music a hobby or is it my other job? And I haven't quite landed on the, the answer to that question yet. I go back and forth on what that is. So really the the lesson in the tale is it, it's helpful to know where that what that hobby truly is because it can easily turn into work too, which is oh, <laughs> which course. is happening to me. But it doesn't doesn't do it doesn't have the same recharge effect once you uh go that far. Uh, mm -hmm. but uh the music definitely I I like getting lost in it. I do sometimes during my lunch breaks I'll make a couple beats as fast as I can and and then <laughs> throw it up on my Instagram or something. Uh, so definitely music, but also enjoy just hikes. Uh, so I, I go on a lot of hikes. Uh, being in the Bay Area, I'm getting spoiled by a bunch of new hikes that I've never seen before, and it's it's very beautiful out here in this state. Uh, so I've uh, been exploring a good bit on that. And it's, it's just real cool to when you get to wherever the point of the hike is you're trying to go to to realize you're just kind of out there probably don't have sad reception yeah you know. <laughs> you might unreachable have... oh no yeah right right <laughs> it's, a, it's a beautiful thing so me and the family do that a good bit too yeah that's really good i have to say so even though i'm at stanford and you're technically our you know enemy being mm -hmm. at berkeley mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> i have to say i love berkeley's campus the botanical gardens there i've gotten yeah. lost there just wandering around spending time there the views are just incredible that redwood grove is just mm -hmm. whimsical and magical and i feel like i'm literally spirited away when i go there um and it's it's amazing so uh, that's another hobby of mine too we have the same hobbies music and like getting outside yeah yeah who knew i know right yeah <laughs> this is, all right like the vibes here. <laughs> <laughs> So you heard so, from I, us, folks. Get outside yeah, and play some music. Yeah. You're you're recharged. There you go. I have a, a buddy uh, that uh, I can't remember his name. I can't think of his name right now, but he also does uh, production. And one of the things he does, he he currently lives, I think, like out in Tokyo or something like that. And he'll go on hikes and then do a video of him producing or doing some beat at like the point of the hype. So there's been a couple where he's oh, like cool. sitting on a mountain edge and he's playing <laughs> something. <laughs> he's blending the two together. I yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. I'm not quite that blended yet. I don't want to <laughs> yeah, carry all the gear. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, this is a quick 30 second story during the pandemic. I think we all re might remember this 2020, like March, April time frame. People were all, you know, uh, quarantining or in their homes kind of stuck, right? And there were so many people going out on balconies and playing their instruments. 
Mm-hmm. And I was living in downtown Madison at the time. And I did that. I went on, went out on my balcony, played my violin. I played Hallelujah. You know, it's kind of like a melancholy yeah. song, but I think we were all feeling feeling that at the, at the time. And it was just, it was so interesting because there was kind of this like cacophony of people who kind of poked their heads out and then also started playing whatever their instrument was mm-hmm. or singing mm-hmm. along or or something. It was just in my in this really small like backyard area. Probably only a handful of people actually heard, but it was just kind of fun. It was just a liberating thing to like just go outside and play your instrument. So I don't know. Maybe that's our yeah. homework. Maybe that's yeah. our new level of recharging, Wes. Yeah. So I <laughs> I, I, I caution. I know, right? I caution y'all. Maybe there was a little bit of COVID effect. I could also see a scenario where you go out there playing your instrument downtown and they're just like hey stop i'm working <laughs> I, mean, it's- I feel like yeah now i feel like i'm gonna get yelled at and people are gonna be like i'm good you know but then i don't know people were like okay this is acceptable <laughs> so we we talked a good bit about things we can do hobbies that we've done outside making like blocking time to take time but what about like once you got that time right so you're in your hobby what what have we done to to your point earlier about making sure folks know that, hey, I'm not actually available for your daily operational stuff. Like I'm, I'm away. I've took it some time for myself. What's some stuff that you've done to, you know, make yourself unavailable? <laughs> you know, I, one thing I've learned is if I know that there's something where I'm, you know, the single point of failure, if you will, or the only person who knows something, before I leave, I make sure I write down whatever it is that someone might need to know. And I work with my my boss and or members of my team directly and say, hey, if this comes up when I'm out, here's what you need to know. Here's here's the history. Here's the situation. Here's some of the background. This is kind of what's been happening and, and background information that you need to know. Names of people, right? Like what the project is, things like that. Maybe some history if there is any to share. Here's my, uh, right now, my current assessment of, of the situation, what I think is happening and what might come up. And here's my recommendation. If something does come up, what to do? And almost like some somewhat of a decision tree. Like if it does come up and it's not urgent and you can wait until I come back, do nothing. Just let me handle right. it. Make sure you make me aware, right? But if it is something where you've tried all these steps that I've outlined and you've gone through everything and it's still not <laughs> looking good, then you can contact me or then you can contact my my boss's boss or something like that. Mm-hmm. It's a little framework I call an S bar because I highlight a situation, background, assessment, and recommendation. And it's literally only supposed to be one page or less, right? I mean, it could be uh-huh. one sentence for each, but it really helps someone readily orient themselves, orient themselves to what's going on and to be able to take some type of action. And sometimes an action is just telling whomever is reaching out sorry, we'll get to this next week, right? That's still an action, yeah, but it's at, least, it's at least acknowledging someone and saying, hey, we can't get to this today. Here's when you can expect to hear back by. If not, here's what to do. And I found that that, and not even only for, you know, unplugging and leaving work, but that communication tool for any type of communication is so helpful. Um, so that would be a recommendation, I think, to this pod, to this podcast and, and our listeners is to try that out. Try highlighting a situation, background assessment and recommendation. The next time, you know, some problem or challenge comes into your lap as a way to communicate to your boss or your leaders for what to do. But another thing um, that I that I like to do is to make sure that I let the people I'm working with know before I leave, especially if I'm anticipating something coming up. Hey, I'll be out. Here's who you can talk to. So just proactively telling them that and then telling them when I'll be back and telling them that I will be away and giving them an email or contact for someone else and letting them know, hey, if this is a true emergency, here's who you talk, who you contact. Um, and that helps a lot too because most folks understand and most folks are reasonable, right? If I say, hey, right. like this year, I got married this year and I was like, I'm going on my wedding. I'm going to my wedding and I'm going on my honeymoon do not contact me. <laughs> That's what I've done. <laughs> and you know, it's fair. And people get that, right? People are reasonable. They're, no one's going to do that. And what, no you one mean, did, thankfully. You didn't, you didn't take your laptop to the wedding? Or what do you mean? <laughs> Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did. And I, I took my email off my phone, everything. Um, you know, and, and to be fair, my team was amazing. Um, I had just had a new teammate start. He had been in their role for maybe like a week or two. And was already reaching out, trying to like get all these things off my plate and help me out. 
and you know, it was just this wonderful camaraderie and making sure that I didn't pick up any new projects when I knew I would be out for a month, which I was out for a solid month. <laughs> so, you know, it's things like that too. It's being strategic. Like you said earlier, like your individual agency, I think is, is really important. And I think that shows like leaderful skills when you're thinking ahead and say, you know, for me, I left in March. And if my a boss or someone came to me and said, hey, we need to do this project, I may or may not volunteer for that. I'll try to negotiate, you know, what my level of commitment looks like and when I start and what the expectations are, knowing that I will be gone for a month. Mm -hmm. And I think that that helps a lot, too. But I'll stop there because I'm curious what you think. Yeah, no, those are great. Uh, that uh, Within Berkeley IT, we actually have a process very similar in regards to when you were mentioning, like, naming who to contact for this. They have a process that all of us uh, as part of the executive leadership team have to do. We have to go into this document, put the dates and then name who our backup is. And then if if there is an emergency, like, is there any way to contact you? There's been a couple of times like, nope, I'm hiking in the mountains. You won't be able to contact me at all uh, during this period of time. Uh, so there's been stuff like that that we do. And I do similar within my teams. We all share our calendar, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, speaking of, so something I've noticed, I'll be curious after I share, Sarah, if you've seen the same, is as I've moved up in the org, what constitutes as an emergency becomes more and more great. Like, it's really not always clear uh, when you when you start to be like a leader of directors and their managers and their staff, like, it, it, it becomes a little more blurry on what that emergency is. It's very, it's very unlikely to be just some specific, like, this X stopped working, Wes, what do I do? It's usually, yeah. like, X stop working and has broken these other downstream systems. Wes, how do we want to communicate while I'm out in Malibu or something? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Figure it out. Bye. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'm yeah. kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> so it it uh it gets it gets a a little challenging. I'd, at least in my personal experience, the more I've moved up, like that balance because it does feel like there's an expectation as you move up. Um, where you're a little bit more available in these some of these scenarios yeah. versus where when someone's more individual uh, contributor focused, it's more, at least in my experience, more tied to like the specific service or system. And uh, so the scope of the problems tend to be a little bit more narrow. Um, so I, I have found some struggles in my, I've only been in this role for a couple of years now, some struggles in knowing when to jump in. So a lot of it comes back now to my own, view on <laughs> on things I mean, as an individual with a sense of the team right you got to keep the team in mind too um but I, I i have found that the biggest thing for me as far as keeping myself as free as possible when i do take time um is to, to really set that tone long before the time comes to actually take time off like the way back to what we were discussing earlier the way that i've supported other folks taking their time off they'll hear me and me i've all individuals join meetings because they thought the meeting was super important, but it was the day, the first day they decided to take off for the week. And I've kicked them out the meeting, not to be rude, but to just. <laughs> well, you, You're holding just, boundaries. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll have to do that with them. And part of it is to make sure they understand like, hey, look, I appreciate you being here, but you don't have to be here. We scheduled the meeting on a time when you were out. So we made a decision that we could still have this meeting without you or we'll cancel it. Right. You know, so part of it is that, and then the other part of it is, so when I don't show up to meetings, when I'm out for a week, it shouldn't be a surprise to you because I don't support yeah. anybody doing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, great point. <laughs> I'm so just that, picturing you kicking someone out of a meeting. Yeah, it's, it's been a, it's been surprisingly more than I thought I'd have to do in my career. I, I thought most <laughs> folks were more like automatically be like, yeah, whatever's on the calendar, I'm not coming. But there's been a few times where I've had individuals that, for, for, you know, in their defense, they were trying to support, they, you know, they were the ones that were most knowledgeable about something. So they just wanted to make oh, sure yeah. we were successful. Uh, but no, I kicked them out to just say, hey, look, if yeah. we weren't <laughs> successful at this meeting, we'll schedule another one or, you know, shame on us for not canceling it. We're good. Right, right. It's it's all a learning experience. And when you're bringing this up, um, I have a few thoughts, but the, what came to my mind initially was um, Priya Parker's book, The Art of Gathering, and I know she was the keynote speaker at the Educa's annual conference mm -hmm. last mm -hmm. year in Denver, and I just thought it was amazing that she was there because when I read her book a few years ago, and it really helped inform a lot of my wedding planning, actually, and there's a, a passage that she has in that book where she talks about 
your responsibility for your guests, for people in your meeting, you know, is is to make sure that they are protected, right? And they're having a good time, mm-hmm. that they're set up for success, all of those things. And if you just open the floodgates and let everyone and everything in, well, you're not doing your job, you know, stewarding that meeting in a leader or someone hosting a wedding, right? If you're just right. letting the floodgates open and just letting everything happen and hoping that it'll be okay, right? Hope is not a plan. Mm-hmm. And what I learned from Priya Parker in her book is it's actually your responsibility to be able to make those decisions and to be able to stand up for what you want and to recognize your role in that, right? And if you think that one adding one person to a meeting may or may not help or bringing one person to your wedding might spoil it for the rest of the folks. Well, if you have 300 people going to your wedding and one person you're worried about, well, why would you bring that one person in who could potentially spoil the time of 300 people? You know, mm-hmm. but it's a hard thing to do. It's a hard thing to stand your ground and to say no. But sometimes saying no is, is the kindest thing we can do. Not only for ourselves, but for those three hundred guests, for those for those folks in your meeting, um, but also for the person themselves, right? Because if they're, you know, on vacation and coming into a meeting, well, chances are they probably don't have good reception, right? They <laughs> probably don't have what they need in front of them to be effective, right? They have all these other things in their head. It's like no one's set up for success at that point, and the only thing that that's going to do is have that person coming to the meeting without the right things that they need maybe fail, you know, uh, as a leader, it's our responsibility to make sure they're set up for success. And if we feel like we can have this meeting without you, then we can have this meeting without you. And it's no reflection on you, your character, your ability to do something or not. And it's not that we don't think you don't, you don't care. It's just that we need to move this forward. And, you know, it's a hard thing to think about because I grew up in the Midwest. I'm Midwest, like modest, nice, to a to a T almost and it's something that when I was raised it was everyone has to be included you know be nice to everybody invite everybody in everybody's welcome mm-hmm. right and I think I had to realize that there's a distinction between that mentality being welcoming and hospitable and also being respectful and mm-hmm. caring and they aren't necessarily mutually exclusive but you are being respectful and caring and welcoming If you do close the door on certain people on certain things in specific occasions or places, Mm -hmm. and it's okay to do that because otherwise you're perceived as the person who just gets walked all over Mm -hmm. or lets, lets everybody else walk all over each other at your own venue, (laughs) right? right? If you don't have a good time, the likelihood of being successful in any of the situations is probably low. So, yeah. So I think about that a lot and I think it's a really good thing to do that. Yeah, and back to your comment, actually, about what an emergency is. I love uh-huh. this. I love this one. It's because when I was working at the University of Wisconsin, my previous role was to lead a team who was responsible for critical infrastructure services. Mm-hmm. So six life and health safety services. Uh, one of them was the door access system for campus. So that included all doors on the university's campus and the hospital. So, you know, this is in the thousands. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. one of the, you know, challenges with that system is, you know, if it goes down, well, people could be trapped, right? People could be stuck in places, even though the doors should fail open, right? For safety reasons. Sometimes, you know, things happen, right? Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. there is uh, always a lot of kind of fear, I think, with that team I was with of, you know, the, the worst possible outcome happening. Which is a good, I mean, it's a good thing. I think we should be right. aware of the likelihood right. of that. We should be aware of what we're up against and what what challenges might come. But the likelihood of those happening, especially how great the team was, were really low. Um, mm-hmm. And if something did happen, it would have probably been out of the team's responsibility, right? right. It, it would have been some extreme things. We had thought of everything. We had redundant systems, separate networks. I mean, you name it, the, the DR plan for, for the all of these services was just phenomenal right and that's the credit to the team right we had thought everything through there's backups upon backups we had a lot of funding supporting all of it it was solid but still you know it's easy and our brains you know are just kind of designed to go into this kind of you know doom and gloom place right the worst outcome possible and when you're working with a team of you know 16 20 people who focus on that all day and their primary role is to keep critical infrastructure running well it's very easy and and you know 
it makes sense that they're thinking about those things because they're getting paid to think about them. Yeah. But the challenge is, it's like, how do we put that in perspective and context, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I think what worked well for us in that space is because we would literally talk about scenarios where, oh, is there blood on the floor, right? Like, right, it, right. did something happen in the hospital where the doors can't failed shut and no one can get out and there's blood mm -hmm. on the floor, right? Like, we would literally talk mm -hmm. about that. And mm -hmm. I know it sounds kind of like, crazy because we're in IT and what, what does blood have to do with IT? Right. But, you know, in that scenario, that was a potential outcome, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think from my lens, anything that doesn't have blood on the floor is not an emergency. Right. Wow. <laughs> and yeah, I know that's, that's actually, an yeah. extreme, but I use that as a perspective all the time because there's mm -hmm. so many things where, you know, it's like, yes, the system went down. Somebody can't get to a portal or access something, but it's typically not an emergency unless it touches like payroll or finance mm -hmm. or like mm -hmm. life health safety things like everything else can wait it really can mm -hmm. yes will mm -hmm. there be an impact of course but there is mm -hmm. no blood on the floor from this impact and that's mm -hmm. that's how i frame it um and and just work backwards from there because my first yeah. thought always and i think it probably will be this way for a long time is is someone hurt and if someone mm -hmm. isn't physically hurt it can wait. <laughs> Typically, in my yeah. mind, it can wait unless, you know, like I said, finance or things like that. People need to get paid, all that kind of stuff. But if someone isn't hurt, if there's no blood on the floor, I'm like, we're good. We can figure this out. You know, it's a completely mm -hmm. different headspace. And I think folks who who have worked in emergency services or anything like that might understand kind of the headspace that I'm coming from when I share that. And it's not from a place of insensitivity. It's just from a place of perspective, really. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's helpful. It's actually uh. Uh, I actually use my health safety colleagues as my example of non-emergencies with my non-health safety <laughs> colleagues. I actually use that metaphor quite a bit. Just like, well, y'all, we don't work in a hospital, so is it really an emergency? <laughs> so it's, uh, <laughs> it's interesting right. that you're, you know, you're, you actually have direct experience in that field. So I've always wondered, yes. what is it that you all say to make it a non-emergency? <laughs> No, I know. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty much like, is there blood up for? No, okay, it's fine. Like, we'll, we'll figure it out. And, and honestly, but I, I also want to say, just because something isn't an emergency doesn't mean right. it's not, like, important or mm -hmm. necessary work or anything like that that has nothing to do with it. Um, and I think that's a distinction that sometimes can be blurred um, yep. or confused. And like you said, that gray area is, oh, if you're not dropping everything, it means you don't care. Or you're not willing to drop everything and come and fix this. And you know, it, in the grand game of things, if you zoom completely out and you're outside of your department, you're outside of even the university and you're looking at just a bigger, broader picture of the world, like the world will continue moving and circling if we don't get to this in four hours. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I know that that's kind of an extreme and I, and I know I can't generalize everything, but mm -hmm. I think that helps at least keep me calm in those scenarios because there's been many scenarios in my career and experience where where shit really did hit the fan mm -hmm. where it which really was an emergency mm -hmm. and i was up you know at 2 a.m trying to figure something out calling my sister my deputy sister at the time at two in the morning <laughs> for something you know it, and it really was and you know and sometimes it's like hard to make that call in the moment but the only yeah. thing i felt like i really was my role was to remain calm and make sure everyone else felt like they had what they needed and could get it done. Mm. And maybe that's a two a.m. call. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? And maybe that's a future episode. Maybe we share some stories. So you got the uh, viewers, listeners, you have to let us know. Share some stories about some efforts that didn't go so well when shit hit the fan. <laughs> what did we do? <laughs> we have plenty of those. <laughs> <laughs> so, so then, uh, I guess now we get towards the end of this. I want to ask one question, right? So we talked about. You know, t taking time, protecting your time. We've talked about uh, some of the fun things that we do. Uh, so we have, you know, this is going to be episode after the holiday. So let's tell folks in review, right? Your holiday season, your December is now over. We're in January. What did you do? If you don't mind sharing, what's one fun thing you did during the holidays if things go according to the Sarah master plan? Uh, well, actually, my my husband and I are going to Mexico. We're going to Puerto Vallarta for Christmas. And the one thing I will be doing is laying on a beach somewhere with a pina colada mm. and not being disturbed. I don't want to look at anybody. I don't want to talk to anybody. I just want to listen to music 
drink mm-hmm. my cocktail and be by the water and just relax. That's and bring like the, bring the violin. You bring, you gonna bring it out? Actually, not on this trip. Not on this trip. Not this trip. Like the humidity. <laughs> 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 but that's you know everything goes to plan. Um, you know I haven't had like a true beach vacation and just a time where I've been able to just turn my brain off in so long mm. and it'll be my mm. winter break from grad school mm. and i won't have classes so i will have yeah. finished 10 classes by then i know right so i'm like i'm ready just to you know have, i don't know if you've ever seen severance that show on apple mm-hmm. tv yeah mm-hmm. <laughs> when i first saw that show it was before i started grad school and how they just like separated you know work from yeah on work just literally in like a blink of an eye just moving out of the space I really didn't understand that until I started grad school. Now mm. I feel like I can do that better. <laughs> and yeah, I think that's show. a skill too. Yeah. yeah. Almost feels like the show was written by a grad student now. I'm wondering. <laughs> which one <I> <laughs> you know, Some days are easier than others, but sometimes I'm like, I'm just shutting this and oof, like I'm, I just can't think about anything more. Like I feel like my brain is so stuck. That there's just yeah. literally nothing else to do but to like focus on something else or just not even think about it. And it's really hard to describe. It's a new feeling for me for sure because mm-hmm. I've always kind of struggled with shutting that off. But I'm going to be shutting off on a beach in Mexico in a few yeah. few weeks here. <laughs> but what about you? That sounds very, very nice. Uh, so I will be going to a beach. But my hope is, is here in Oakland at the Oakland Zoo, they do a thing every year called Glow Fari where they light up the whole zoo and holiday lights and festive stuff. I have not seen it yet. Uh, So my hope is that we sign up for one of these nights. It's extremely hard to sign up for. Like they slow down the uh, website and put you in queues during the holiday season because they get so much activity early on in the season. And then folks book it on the way out. So fingers crossed we didn't make it last year. Fingers crossed we make it in the list this year and get to go. Yeah. My fingers are crossed. It's like you're trying to get Taylor Swift tickets for the Eras tour. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe odds like... be over in your favor. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't think it'd be this hard to go to the zoo, but here we are. <laughs> I know, really. Well, I hope that works out for y'all. That sounds like it'll be fun. Yeah. Well, with that, uh, thank you, everyone. Happy holidays to you and yours, Sarah. Happy holidays to our viewers. Uh, thank you to the whole a rising voices podcast team for all of our work this will be episode number what four so we're oh, four right. deep we we, we keep it <laughs> down we hope you all are entertained uh i'm wes johnson and and i'm sarah buska thank you all for listening 